Good evening, everyone, and welcome to Theology Talk here at Thoughtful Faith. This is a show where we explore both our own theology in the restored Church of Jesus Christ and the theology of others. I'm your host, Jacob Hansen, and joining me today is my co-host, Hayden Carroll. Hello. All righty. Well, let's get going. So um, make it a little bit of a different video today. So what Hayden and I want to do is we want to actually review um, Julie Hanks and Bridger Coburn uh, decided to do a video responding essentially to my video. And the, here's the thing. I'm not responding to this video or we're not responding to this video particularly because it is her or Bridger, both of whom we obviously have significant disagreements with, but because these ideas are out there and frankly, they're kind of growing and popular and we want to make sure that people are aware of it. That way they can kind of, kind of see it. Does that sound good, Hayden? Absolutely. Awesome. So let's just get right into it, and uh, we'll start watching some of their their interview. And just so, if anyone doesn't know, I made a couple of videos about Julie Hanks once I got to know some of her content and saw some of the things she was saying that was pretty bad. I'll, I'll link those videos uh, in the description of this video so you can see them. Um, and then Bridger actually came and wanted to come onto my show to defend her uh, and her positions. I did that interview frankly didn't feel like it went very well for Bridger and his defense of her, but then eventually he started his own channel and decided to reach out to her as one of his first guests, first guests that he got a lot of views out of. And, um, but again, I, as I watched it, I was kind of like, okay, like, I think this would be a good opportunity to, to address some of this stuff. So well, one of the things you guys will look for as we go, as we go for one of the reasons we're making this video is because it's obvious that Bridger agrees with her on a lot of her stances. And so he doesn't really press her uh, in any amount, I think. And so we're going to talk a little bit about some of the things he could have asked her and some of the things that maybe he should have pressed her on that he chose not to for, for whatever reason. We'll talk about it. Absolutely. All righty. Well, let's uh, let's get rolling here. Let's pull up the video and get started. I love that. So I, yeah, my goal here is to like, I guess like can like clarify and just come to like discuss a lot of these criticisms because I think yeah. like 95% of them are unfair um, yeah. and probably malicious. I would even go so far as to say that. Yeah. Uh, so there was um, a couple of videos made that I know that you are aware of and I don't even want to say where they are because you know i but it was it was definitely malicious and made to i mean even the the cover photo that was used was made to look like i'm in opposition to the brethren which anyway so um so before we get started i actually want to kind of start here with an area that uh, kind of to to just show everyone like i'm not a bad faith actor here first of all i you can watch the videos. It was not intended to be malicious. I did not attack her character. I attacked these ideas and contrasted the things that she was saying to what the brethren were saying. And, but also I want to start off this video just by saying I did get something wrong in that video. There was something that I actually got wrong. And so I wanted to actually begin this, this kind of analysis by going over this, what I actually feel like I got wrong. So I'm going to let her explain. Uh, basically in my video, she had said something about basically saying that all of us are cafeteria Mormons. And my thought was, as you know, President um, Nelson has said, you know, we can't pick and choose what, you know, commandments we follow and you know we can't be cafeteria latter-day saints and uh anyway she came out and said you know we're all cafeteria mormons but i i think i actually misunderstood what she was getting at and so i wanted to let her in this video uh just so everyone knows that i'm i'm not you know if i did something wrong i'll admit it and in this one i did do it i i, I misrepresented her so i i'll actually allow her now to uh i'll start off rather than offering a critique i'll i'll say where i was actually off so let's watch it we're all cafeteria Mormons, like we're all in this together. The truth is that we all pick and choose to some degree what we will focus on in the gospel at any given time in our lives. I'm not saying pick pick and choose what commandments to keep. I'm saying like we have to, like I'm, I'm focusing on like having love in my heart for every human being right now. I'm not focusing on journal writing right now. Like I can't focus on everything everybody says. So we have to pick and choose. That's what I'm saying. I'm not saying pick and choose the commandments. 
Right now I'm focusing, so this says right now I'm being more, uh, focusing on being more compassionate, mourning with those who mourn, writing in my journal, well that was then, praying more sincerely, seeking Heavenly Mother, and being more a more present, mindful parent. I listen to counsel and pray that the Spirit will help me know if there's something else I need to focus on. So that was taken entirely out of context. So again, she's talking about basically that we can't focus on everything at once. We have to pick certain things that we, you know, place our attention on to work on and to focus on. And in that sense, we're cafeteria Mormons. And if that was her point, like, all right, yeah, no, that's, you know, fair enough. I don't have a problem with that. Here's the hard thing is I think, so you'll see later in this video that for those of you who are watching, she kind of has a track rec record of when, when the brother and say something, she will sometimes make a social media post that says the exact opposite. And so I think she's. it's kind of a struggle here because President Nelson meant one thing by it, and she said the exact opposite, but she meant something totally different. So I'm, I'm kind of confused. Like, like she, I'm kind of confused with why she's using the same terminology as President Nelson when she actually didn't mean what he meant. So there yes. is some discrepancy there that I think she may was may may have at first been unclear about, but I'm glad she she kind of uh, cleared that up. Yeah, and I mean, in the in this interview with Bridger, she does say that sometimes she doesn't word things right, and fine, fair enough. I'm not going to pick apart every single word she says. We all say things that are awkward sometimes. But, you know, if you go out and put a big post as we're all cafeteria Mormons after President Nelson just said we can't be cafeteria Mormons, right. it, you know, you can see how people might interpret that wrong. But let, let's get to the actual areas of disagreement. So sure, um, the, the I think this one, and I think Hayden, you'd agree with me, this idea of personal authority, this is like a... This is like a thing of hers. It's a core like doctrine. So let's let's let her kind of explain it. Let's let's make sure we steel man it. I really want to make sure that we give her a fair shake, um, and then we'll examine why you and I maybe think that this is a problematic idea. And it's it's good that we do this first because this really underlines all I think every issue that that we're going to be talking about today. So it's good that we start with it. Yeah, definitely. So, but when I talk about personal authority and general authority, that's what I'm I'm talking about. Your choice and personal revelation coming together, and then ultimately you deciding what you're going to do with that. So, okay, let's steal man for a minute here. You know, that was kind of a quick clip, but uh, she's posted about this before, and I've seen it, and I think we can kind of steal man it right. So, personal authority is what she calls personal revelation combined with agency. And, and, and so that is what she calls personal authority, right? And if you think about it, okay, let's, again, let's, I'm trying to give the devil's due. Yeah. If I receive revelation from God to do something, then, and then I use my agency to do it, like, what's the problem here, right? And so she is saying that you have this idea of personal authority that interfaces with general authority, right? So the general officers of the church will give general counsel, right, to the whole world, but then you as an individual, as she would say, use your personal authority to decide how to implement that and or if to implement that into your life. What's the problem with that, Hayden? So, so here's the first thing that everyone needs to realize. I have yet to see Julie Hanks or Bridger, I, I think in this whole interview or anything that she's ever posted, I've never seen her um, be grounded or give evidence for anything that she says from a doctrinal standpoint. I don't see any scriptures. I don't think, see any words of the prophets. Um, at least the United words of the prophet, she may pull a quote from here or there. Um, but, but one of the things that I think she struggles with the most is it's, it's mostly her philosophy that I'm not sure exactly where she derives it from. And I think maybe by the end of this video, we'll, we'll get a better idea of where she gets that from. But uh, the first issue with personal authority and the way that she defines it is that she doesn't put any bounds or limits on personal revelation. Uh, meaning I would, I would guarantee that she would struggle. I think if, if we asked her and I wish she would just come on the show, so we could talk with her about it, or I wish Bridger would have asked her, 
okay, are there any limits to receiving personal revelation? Um, and I think she would really struggle with that question of what are the bounds and limits? Uh, kind of like President uh, or Elder uh, Renlin recently talked about in General Conference, how we each have our, what, what do you call it? Our, um, our runways. Yeah, our runway, our, our stewardship. And so I think where the big struggle comes in with this one is I would guarantee that she would say that if God tells you something or if you feel God tells you something, that that gives you more authority than the brethren to mm -hmm. to do things in your life that if, even if they are contradicting what you feel God is telling you, that you still have the right to act out of certain behavior or mindset based on what you feel God is telling you. Yeah. And I mean, I, to be fair, I think in the interview, she kind of was like, well, you know, we have to kind of take into consideration the, what the brethren have to say. Right. And I think, but I think this goes back to something that I talk about a lot. Um, because so first of all, personal, your agency doesn't apply author, it doesn't imply authorization. Authority implies that you are authorized to do it. Now, what would give you authorization to do it is if God himself actually commanded you to do something. But here's where I have a problem. How does she know that it's God that's commanding her to do it and not her own whims? Like what kind of like you're saying, what's the check here? Like yeah. if, if, if at what point are you going to doubt that it was God that told you to do something? You know, like if God tells me to go out and do the exact opposite of what the brethren say, I'm going to kind of be like, you know, was that God or was that maybe another spirit that's trying to influence yeah. me? Yeah. You, you know, it's crazy. Um, I won't use any names or be too specific. There was someone in my ward. I was teaching Sunday school probably three or four months ago. And we got into this conversation about what are the bounds of revelation? It was actually before general conference, funny enough, before uh, president or elder Renlin talked about it. And there was a prominent leader in my ward who I asked this, I just hypothetically, it's in front of all the adults, you know, it was adult Sunday school. And I, and someone said, well, if God tells you to do it, then, then you can do it. And I said, okay, well, what if God tells me to cheat on my wife? Are you going to give me the green light for that? And I had this member of my ward say, well, sure. Like, I don't have, we don't have the authority. And I said, are you kidding me? Like, do, do you hear what I just said? <laughs> you would give me the, green, if I told you God told me to do that, you'd say, yeah, go ahead. Like where, so where does it stop? You're yeah. right. And that's a very, that's a very dangerous thing. Right. And we yeah. have been taught that there, that any revelation that we will receive should fall within the bounds of what the brethren have asked. Now uh, let, let's, let's continue on. I want to, I want to try and get to more of the video, but um, I think we'll flesh this out a little more. Let's, let's hear what she has yeah. to say about it. And I think ultimately we get to choose. And that's where people are. No, no. God's the <laughs> ultimate authority over your life. And I'm like, if I choose for him to be the ultimate authority, personally, I choose that, but not everybody does. And, and that's okay. Right? Like, so people are saying, well, you think, you know, you don't think God's the ultimate authority. I'm like, he is because I've chosen him to be the ultimate authority in my life. But other people choose differently, and they get to, and that's agency. Um, <laughs> that was shocking to me. Um, no, God is the ultimate authority of our lives, whether we want to or not. We're just choosing to disobey God and to face the, uh, the uh, consequences of those actions. And no, that's not okay. It's not okay not to make God the number one authority of your life. Like, what? in the world who like what like th she's saying that i'm the ultimate authority of my life and i choose to allow god into it but it's like no that's the whole point our point is is that whether you like it or not you face the judgment of god yeah and so you he, he's the ultimate ruler of the universe that has the ultimate authority and we conform ourselves to him because that is the way to happiness, success, joy, all the rest of it. Well, this this goes back to I think the first point that I that I brought up is she doesn't ever bring up any. There, there's no foundation of of truth as revealed by the prophets, ancient or modern. It's kind of just like mm, this. This is how I see it, 
And it's kind of interesting, um, and I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit more. It, it seems like like she, she and I had just would love to talk with her about this. And if and if I have this wrong, I just would love to know. It almost seems like she wants to be in the church, but she doesn't want to accept everything that comes with it in regards to the world. It's kind of like what you're saying. Like if you're a Latter-day Saint and you understand the doctrine that is being taught by the brethren forever, then you then you would agree with what you just said, that God is the ultimate authority over everybody, and we reject him, but he's still the authority. Yeah, other words, we reject him at our peril. Like, that's yes. the reason that we want people to come unto Christ and be saved. Like, this isn't even Mormonism. This is Christianity 101. Yeah. It's like, dude, you, you need to repent and be saved. Yeah. But her message isn't to repent and be saved and come no. into Christ. It's like, you know, I make my authority and you don't. And, you know, we all get to choose. Yeah. It's yeah, like, it's... this is like 15 year old who <laughs> is talking about agency stuff. You know what I mean? It's like, well, I have my agency. So I can, you know, I can, uh, you know, what I choose, that's uh, my yeah. choice. Right. It's like, yeah. yeah. And we want people to choose the right. Like yeah. to say that you have a choice and she does this a lot. And I think we'll see it as we go forward. It's to describe what is. You say, it is your choice. Yeah, duh. That doesn't say anything. I want to know what should you choose. And that's where I'm just like, like, she just is kind of like, oh, well, you know, it's, mm, ha, mm, there's, you know, everybody and, has their path. It's and, like, you know, maybe she's coming at this from from her therapist background. Of she, Maybe she's trying to be neutral and and. Let pe let people live their truth, you know, because I don't think anyone us, either of us or anyone really, anyone who has half a brain would deny that we have the, uh, you know, the legal right or the power to choose whatever we want within the bounds of the law. Now, even without, even the, without the bounds, take the law yeah. out of it. We have agency. God allows us to make the choices we want to make. Yeah, That's just a statement about what is. The big question is what, what should, should we be? Do? Yeah, and 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 so let's 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 take a look here. Um, yeah. uh, going too far, right? Let's let's kind of look at this here. So, so do you think it's like possible for um, to take that internal authority that we um, too far to where we end up like worshiping ourselves instead of God or allowing bad habits to take up that we claim as part of ourselves, but are so, more of like bad things? So I, yeah, what are your thoughts? No, because. No, there it is. We can't take it too far. <laughs> we can't take our personal authority too far and and cross lines we shouldn't. But anyway, let's let's hear what she has to say. I believe people are good, and if you are seeking personal authority, I believe people are good, and if you're seeking personal authority, I mean, I'm just kind of like, do you mean? I believe people are good, and if you're seeking God, then good things will happen. But, I mean, just consider this scripture. You know? It, it's like the natural man's an enemy to God. The only way we actually become good is by yielding ourselves to God. Anyway, I'm going let, to let, – let's let her finish this part, well, and then I'll let you comment on well, it. Well, okay. Yeah, go ahead. Go ahead. All right. Well, I was, I, uh, I'll say one That's thing. That's it. I, I, again – she needs to come on here so we can just ask her some of these questions. But I, I, she must be totally unaware of the schisms of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, of people who probably genuinely believe that they are receiving personal revelation from God, but it, it takes them away from the church. So when, when Bridger says, can this go too far? And she says, no. My question for her is, her is well, what, what about the people who receive revelation to, that tells them to walk away from their effectually walk away from their covenants. Like, is that okay with you? Or you know, like how like well, do you really mean there's see. no limit? I, I think she I think she kind of answers that. Let's let's continue okay. and see what she says. Hey, good that's going to lead you to good things. So it's going to lead you to good things if you follow your personal kind of revelation. So let's see what that has to do with people leaving. Yeah. Um, so touching on, I know, yeah, we touched on a little bit, but leading people away, leading people out of the church. Um, that's might be the biggest criticism you get. Okay. Um, yeah, here's, here's, here's my thoughts on that. 
when people claim their personal authority, they sometimes choose. To oh, they sometimes choose to leave. Hold on. I'll bring that back. Or to take a step back. To leave the church or to take a step back by claiming their personal authority. And that is terrifying, especially when women do that in a patriarchal culture. So you can't take it too far. And it by seeking your personal authority, you may leave the church. And yeah. for her, she's not, she's not saying that they're making the biggest mistake of their life or anything like that. Again, this, this goes back to she's not defining the bounds of revelation. I would be curious to know if she believes that God can give someone a revelation to to break their covenants. Well, she but, well, well, real quick. I mean, obviously, based on what she said right there, yes. Yeah, but, that's but, that's my concern. But but she would say now she does say in her interview. To be fair, she says in that interview with Bridger, like, yeah, you know, it, it, you know, you have to take into consideration the prophets and these other things. But ultimately, so, so her thing is sort of like you have to consider all these other things. But ultimately. You get to decide. And yeah, again, but, do, you, do you hear that language I just used? You get to decide. She's yeah. describing what is. Yeah. She's not describing what you should do. Right. And that's where this is this morally relativistic language that says, I'm not, you know, I'm not in, I'm not out. It's just kind of like, you know, I and, and and kind of playing in the middle instead of actually saying what should or shouldn't happen. And, you know, I think one of the issues that she runs into is a lot. I, I think there is a strong case to be made that a large portion of her audience would she'd really some she would have received from some backlash if she started to be too much on the side of what ought to be. If she started to make moral claims that the church makes. I, I think she would receive a lot of backlash from her audience who often praise her for for playing on both sides. I, I don't know if that makes sense. And I don't know if we have any comments from or anything from her post. But, but anyone who follows her by any amount can see that that's who her audience is. Yeah, the audience, I always tell people to look at the, her Instagram page and look at the people who follow her who you know. And you'll notice there's a pattern. Um, now, with that in mind, um, I, Bridger. So I, this is the other thing. I, this isn't just all about Julie. Now, Julie has a hundred thousand followers on Instagram. I probably should have mentioned that at the beginning. She has a large following amongst LDS women, right? Especially women who are, you know, tend to be more progressive in their worldview. Um, and this, um, it's interesting because she was recently on the faith matters podcast. Uh, they, they interviewed her and she talked all about developing a self and personal authority and all this stuff. And uh, I want to play a little clip from that um, just because Bridger and I were having a conversation about what she was talking about. And it was it was shocking to me to see where Bridger was. And so this isn't just about Julie. Bridger, Julie, there's a mindset of particular people in the church that I think we should be aware of here. And, and again, I just want to kind of play this. So let's let's listen to Julie. She's talking about the development of a self in its relationship to the church itself. So let's take a look. Is there a way to just, I know you can't guarantee, but like a way to ensure that, that this isn't going to break a relationship, whether it's a relationship with the, with the church or a relationship with a, with a person. There is no guarantee. It may break. And, and so the alternative is you don't develop, but some people, as they develop a sense of self, they see, or they decide their self decides, I, I can't be associated with this organization. Yeah. And that's their choice. Did you notice the language there? Yep. yep. There's the neutrality again. It's what the it neutrality. Is. It's your choice as though we don't care about that choice. Like right. we care about that choice. And so anyway, we, we go on. I just wanted to pause and just hit that real quick. So let's yeah. continue. So she says here after that, she, one of the things she posted online is, you can be connected to deity without organized religion, and you can also have a connection to religion without a connection to deity. Now, this part was really problematic to me because she basically said, in order for you to develop a self, you essentially may have to break your relationship with the church. And 
I mean, do we really prioritize the development of our self over our, our covenants when you literally have Jesus saying, you know, to deny yourself and to follow him? I mean, what's your take on that? Um, well, first her Instagram post that you shared there, I don't think there's anything problematic with that. Do you, um, that you can be connected to deity without organized religion. I mean, you can vaguely be connected to deity, but it, our, our kind of core doctrine is that the way that we truly connect with deity in a salvific way is through covenant. And okay. So, so, and I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be chill here. Right. But we're looking at 99.9% .9 of the world, right? Are we uh -huh. willing to say that they're not capable of being connected to deity or not to the extent that like members? It, it, it's going to depend on what you're going to mean by being connected to deity. What it sounds like she's saying is that, hey, you don't need organized religion to be connected to deity. When our doctrine is very much come to us and deepen your connection with deity to unto salvation, because a connection to deity that doesn't lead you to salvation is, I mean, not worth that much. Like, we're trying to bring to pass the immortality and eternal life of man. And the only way that you do that is through covenant relationship with God. And so when you tell people that, hey, you don't need our church, organized religion, to have a connection with deity, while technically that's sort of true, like, yeah, you know, you'll be able to feel the spirit, but it's like, and you won't enter the celestial kingdom or reach your highest potential. It's like that was kind of a big part for her to leave out, you know. See, that's where I that's where I disagree. And again, I'm looking at 99% of the world. I think this life is about being good human beings. I think if these ideas, and again, I'm not negating, I think covenants and ordinances are beautiful and important and essential, but I do not think they're the primary purpose of this life. I think the primary purpose of this life is to become good human beings, to do so, so, so good quick, with just, morality. Just to, I just want to make sure I, I understand this point. So you don't see the primary purpose of life as making and keeping covenants with our Father in heaven? No, I do not. And did Jesus, did Jesus teach that? Well, I, I mean, my understanding is, is that he said basically the only way to enter into the kingdom of heaven was by being born again by water and the spirit. Yeah, he, he mentioned that. And then again, that's that's valuable and important. And it's part of getting to the celestial kingdom. That is a part of our journey here and through the eternity. It's it's a it's a it's it's a requirement. Heaven. Yes, I absolutely agree. But we have the millennium and all these opportunities to do that. Um, but again, if that was the prime focus, the number one focus of this life. Why was that not more of an emphasis in the Sermon on the Mount? Why, why did Jesus not spend time teaching these things, teaching about the endowment well, would, ceremony, I, teaching about baptism, teaching about the gift in specific ways that we structure it today? To me, this life has to be, logically, it has to be about who we are as people, what we do with the attributes of Christ that we naturally come to learn. Because we're looking at 99% of the world. I think God is smarter than to just not take care of 99% of the world. Well, no, I'm not, and, and there's a there's a part of that to which I agree. So I'm gonna I'm gonna focus on the part that I agree on here first. You're right, 99.99% .99 of people in the world are not gonna join the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints in this life. But where I push back on this is but if you are a baptized member of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, you have taken upon yourself the covenant to bring the kingdom of God to earth by helping every creature, as Jesus said at the end of his life, to baptize them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in order to build the kingdom of God on earth. So to sort of say, hey guys, you don't need organized religion can very easily be translated over to you don't need the kingdom of God. And, and that to me is like, that's, that, that, I mean, what is our message if not that we are here to bring the kingdom of God to the earth and we want all people to that possible to enter into covenant relationship with God? Um, to me, our message is kindness. Like Joseph Smith taught, our religion is kindness. We have to be careful that love and empathy. <laughs> okay. Yeah, there's, there's a lot. There's a lot there. There's so what, much what to talk about there. Um, <laughs> so first and foremost, I mean, our religion is kindness and life is just about being a good person. Like, 
I mean, did the missionaries go to people and be like, hey, you know, like, just be a good person. It'll all work out in the millennium. Yeah. That's our message to the world. Yeah. Again, and I think Bridger is also an offender of of, of, Jul- of what Julie Hanks does and that he doesn't provide any. And if he does provide a source, it's it's a proof text of, well, Joseph Smith once said that our religion is kindness. So that's what, I, that's what this is all about. Oh, I mean, I was thinking like, about like, like, let's go to James, you know, where yeah. he talks about faith without work. Yeah. But also, we have to remember, I was just thinking about this, works without faith. Yeah, doesn't save you. So if you go out and works without faith is I'm I'm a good person. It's it's the guy that all of us who are missionaries went and knocked on their door and they said, Hey, I don't need all your religious stuff. I'm a good guy, right? I do good stuff. Yeah, I don't need all that stuff. And what was our message back to them? It wasn't like, oh yeah, you're good. Yeah, you're good. Yeah. It was like, no, you need to place your faith in Jesus yeah. Christ because it is by faith we are saved, not of works, lest any man should boast. That's where the evangelicals actually have it right. Yeah. And, we, and I always bring that up because we have a problem in the church with people who believe in works without faith. Yeah. And the idea is that we show our faith in not just in being good people and being kind, but in the Lord Jesus Christ by literally participating in an ordinance in which our old identity is washed away and we are born a new creature, totally taking on ourselves the identity of a Christian. And and our old self is dead. And that our works are filthy rags to God, if not through faith in Jesus Christ. It is Christ who provides the grace to save. And if they're going to just be a good person, it's like, and this whole like, well, 99% of people won't accept the church. Like, fine, but you have. And so is yeah. Julie. Like, if Julie wasn't a member of the church, I wouldn't care. But like, when you make covenants here, and, and I don't care because of Julie specifically per se, as much as it is, Julie is talking to, she's normalizing the idea that you can be a covenant member of the church and Bridger, and it's, and it's just like, we'll just be a good person. You know, it's not, you know, the rest of that stuff doesn't really matter. Well, remember where this all started. It's from that post where she said you can be connected to deity without organized religion, which as a covenant keeping member of the church, that's an, that's an issue. And I don't know if we can. That's, a, pull, that's actually, that's a big issue. I don't like, know. Can, can you really pull. tell people as a Latter-day Saint baptized covenant member of the church that you don't need organized religion? Yeah. We're an organized religion. 100%. Yeah, and so I don't know if we could find the quotes or we'd have to look them up later or or if anyone just go look on their posts. There are people who have told Julie, like, hey, like, since I've been watching you, and, and I think there is one actually about the gar- temple garment we may watch. Yeah, we'll go into that but one. But there are people who who have this mindset of, oh, Julie, Julie said it's okay that I can be connected to God with that organized religion. There's my pass, if you will. There's yeah. my permission to leave the church and I can still be connected to Didi, like Julie said. So, so, so it, it, my issue is if she's saying things that give people the permission in their minds to leave the church, that's very problematic. Well, she says me. the permission comes ultimately from you. You know, it's a personal yeah. authority. If you feel it, do yeah. it rather than like for us, it's like, uh, if I feel it, yeah. check it with, you know, if it falls within the bounds of, you know, I need to check to make sure it's coming from God and not from somewhere else. But yeah. anyway, let's continue on with the video here. And, and I would, uh, just before we watch it, yeah. I, I would challenge anyone who's watching this video, because I'm, I'm sure we're going to get a lot of people who agree with us and some people who watch this who are going to agree with Julie. I would, I, I can speak for myself and Jacob, tell me if you agree. I'm doing my best to align myself with the prophets and, and, and to look at their stewardship and see where God has given them authority to speak on, you know, any amount of topics and align myself with them. I do not see Julie doing that. And that's where the issues arise. I, I, think. Would, I would just say it this way. Her, yeah. her ideas, the ideas yeah. that she's putting on, like I want to, any ideas that I have, if you guys can refute it using scripture and the words of the prophets, and not, I don't mean just like a proof text here or there. I'm talking about a consistent theme. If you can find a consistent theme that's running through the Old Testament, New Testament, the Book of Mormon, the the Doctrine and Covenants, the words of the modern prophets. Then you col- you get what you know. What I call my you know trademark thing the col- a collective witness of God's servant saying something. And if I go contrary to that, 
boy, I better have a good explanation as to why. And it better not just be, well, you know, I kind of got this whimsical feeling that I, 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 that I, that it was okay that I, I go against what the, the Lord has said. So anyway, let's, let's, let's delve into this a little bit more. And, and also, I come from the philosophy that the church isn't for everyone. I have family members who they are happier and healthier outside of the church. So I don't, and I know people who've left and come back or who, you know, I, I'm not afraid of that. But if, if you think leaving the church is the absolute worst thing that anyone could ever do, then yeah, I'm sure that's upsetting if someone happens to follow me and leaves the church and that you want somebody to blame, you know? Okay. But I'm not yeah. that powerful. Yeah. I say, I say, and members will get so mad at me for saying it, but I think this life is far more about who we are as people rather than what we believe or what organizations we're tied to. Oh, there, there it is again. I mean, oh, a message. Like, like what, what, Please show me in the scriptures where Jesus ever said it doesn't matter what you believe or what institutions you're a part of. Like, yeah. what? Go to yeah. any of our prophets, any of our scriptures, anything. It's all come unto Christ, be baptized, make covenants, keep the covenants, stay on the path, hold to the rod. Like, it's <laughs> not what they're saying. It's yeah. the opposite. Like, how can a Latter-day Saint say this? Yeah, and you know, I'd be curious to know how Bridger would justify that. If I remember correctly, when he when he told you that same thing, he said logically, that's what this life is about, and that's the word he used. It, and he didn't say doctrinally, and so he's coming to this it's logical not logical. conclusion. It's yeah, not well, logical that's... to say that I'm a Christian, but I don't follow any of the things that Jesus Christ said. Yeah, <laughs> and and you know, I'm trying to think his mindset. If he's thinking that you know, most of the people will not accept the gospel on the earth. So if that's the case, then the best thing for them to be is good people. You know, I could kind of see where he's coming from yeah, there. But, fair but, enough. And but I my think question is, then why do we do proxy work for the dead? Right? Is it? Well, he, he, I'm sure he believes that they're essential and all that stuff. I, I'm going to try and do my best to say what Bridger would say. Bridger would say, look, at the end of the day, like, you know, we can take care of all that stuff in the millennium. In this life, you know, we just want people to be good people. And if you're a good person, it'll eventually work out. And there's a certain truth to that. Good people, we do believe, will eventually be saved. But you're a Latter-day Saint, and you've been given a commission to go with God. They have the excuse of saying, well, I didn't know any better, and so I did the best with what I have. Right. But we're not people who don't have. Like, we have. And we have to act on the knowledge that we have. And our knowledge is to baptize everyone and, and to tell them and to share the light and truth of the gospel with everyone. Not uh, anyway. You're starting to sound we, like an evangelical. <laughs> That's good. We're, we're a lot more. I, I, I love my evangelical brothers. They, 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 yeah. they can correct some of the excesses of, of, of certain types of thinking. So I, I appreciate what they say. That's good. So here we go. Each of us has to face the matter. Either the church is true or it is a fraud. There is no middle ground. It is the church and kingdom of God or it is nothing. I don't know about you, but this doesn't sound like what they were just talking about. This is his work. He established it. He has revealed its doctrine. He has outlined its practices. He created its government. It is his work and his kingdom. And he has said, they who are not for me are against me. The book of Revelation declares, I know thy works, that thou art neither cold nor hot. I would thou wert cold or hot. So then, because thou art lukewarm, and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Oof. Oof. That last part, as I was, as I was listening to that, I was thinking about that sort of morally neutral language. Yep. You know, neither cold nor hot. 
And again, I think, <clears throat> I mean, let's be honest here. If she took a hard stance on the moral issues that the church does, and, and if she, and if she said, "No, you, you got you got to look towards the stewardship of the brethren," or or if she said, "We cannot receive revelation that is contradictory to the brethren," I think she'd be a lot less popular. I mean, she has a hundred thousand followers. Well, well, here's and, here's here's an example. Yeah, uh, and we'll talk more about it later. But it's very obvious that she doesn't believe that homosexual behavior is sinful. And she won't come out and say that, right? She won't come out and publicly just be like, there's nothing wrong with it, although she gets pretty dang close. And that's that's what's actually surprising. But it's like she knows if she if she just comes out and is straight up honest and just says what she thinks, that she could potentially face uh, you know, uh, you know, apostasy yeah, sure. uh, for 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 publicly being out openly contradicting the brethren. Um which Bridger but, says she does, by the way, which I think is interesting. Yeah, and and we'll talk more about that later when he when he says that. But the that so she won't do that, right? And so she'll play again in the middle. She won't say, but she won't come and say no. Homosexual behavior is indeed sinful, right? Because her audience would not respond to that well at all, right? right? And so you end up having this middle ground that you're playing. You're not. Lukewarm. It's a lukewarm. Yeah. And, and I think that that's just the vibe you get over and over. So and she, um, and she does it, you know, it's a smoke screen of, of uh, very vague. Right. And I don't know if we're going to watch some clips about the family proclamation, very vague in suggesting things, but not necessarily defining terms or yep. attitudes. It's, it's very vague. Yep. Absolutely. All right. Let's continue on. Um, Cause I think a lot of this stems from, the way she views herself as a psychologist. So there's that. Awesome. I love that. So one of the first questions I have, and I think this is one of the big ones people have yeah. is, are you on the platform as a therapist or a member first? A therapist first. Therapist first. I, I, I don't identify as an LDS therapist even like I, that's not in my, in my little Instagram, you know, definition yeah. or, or, or kind of, uh, you know, whatever it is, bio. I don't, I am a therapist who has worked with a lot of LDS people. Gotcha. So and I, I am a member of the church. Just kind of like a side note, you know, I, and I happen to be a member of the church and I, I don't, like for me, and, and I assume she's been to the temple, she's made covenants of consecration. Everything that you are is dedicated to the building up of the kingdom of God on earth. And so to kind of be like, you know, I'm, I'm on here as a therapist and as a therapist, I got to kind of, you know, take my religion and put it in its little box because I don't want my religion doing that. Now, now I can hear an audience member saying, well, that's what therapists have to do. You can't be out there preaching and, 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 and doing that. So what do you think? Like, how, how do you reconcile that? You know, it's, uh, if you want to take an Orthodox view, I think you need to get a new job. If, if somebody comes to you and says, you know, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a member of the church. Cause I think she does deal with a, a lot of and help a lot of, or she has a lot of LDS clients. I would assume yeah, the vast majority, I'm sure. And, and again, we'll never know because we're not in those conversations. But if, if somebody hypothetically were to come to her and say, you know, hey, like, I think I'm gay and I and I think that I would be happiest living a gay lifestyle. If, if she were to validate that, in my opinion, it's about it, it's that's a, a, a break of covenants to encourage someone to in any way, shape or form to go against the commandments in any way. Well, well and we, well, this I, is the thing is if, if you want to try and create this, like we go with what's true, right? Right. And what's going to actually bring people ultimate happiness. And if your job as a therapist is just to make people feel good here and now and to validate their choices, even if those choices eternally are going to damn them to hell. Yeah, you're right. I think you, you got a problem there. Like you don't like, you don't give people advice that's going to harm them spiritually and then go to the Lord and say, well, you know, Lord, it was, it was part of my job. <laughs> you know, I had yeah. to, you, you don't, yeah. you, and at the end of the day, it's like, it's what's, what is true. Is it true that that person is actually going to be happier 
yep. in in their life if they embrace that particular lifestyle. Like I I couldn't you can't endorse that and you should you should have some sort of a thing that says look I approach things from a Latter Day Saint perspective. You can't yeah. check your religion at the door. I, you know I I wonder are we gonna watch that clip? I hope we watch the Elder Holland clip. Yeah, let's let's actually go to that. I have a clip yeah. here. Uh, Elder yeah. Holland had some some rather strong feelings about the idea of you know not leaving our religion behind and maybe checking it at the door when we go to work. We check our religion at the door. Lesson number one for the establishment of Zion in the 21st century. You never check your religion at the door. Not ever. My young friends, that kind of discipleship cannot be. It is not discipleship at all. As the prophet Alma has taught the young women of the church to declare every week in their young women's theme, we are to stand as witnesses of God at all times and in all things and in all places that ye may be in. Well, I know your platform isn't testimony based. What can you tell me a little more about that? Yeah, so I talk about how people can interact with the culture, with with each other around religious topics. That's that's what I do. I my platform is not to bear testimony. That's what I do in fast and testimony meeting. That's what I did when I spoke in church a couple of weeks ago. You know, she, she just said something that I never caught before. She did Correct me if I'm wrong. Did she say her platform is to talk about, how did she word something with regarding religious? Yeah, religious, like helping people to like basically navigate religious like issues within yeah. their relationships. And so I'm curious to know how she would justify that being a covenant endowed, sealed member of the church. How do you how do you have a platform where you're not doing anything but encouraging people to repent and to come unto God? Like well, that that I, I, again, I, I look at it and I go, okay, well, but she's using I, I'll I'll guarantee you, I don't know what she'll say. She'll say, I'm a therapist. And my job as a therapist is to be like this neutral party. And I think there's an inherent problem with that sort of a philosophy because when you are a covenant member of the church, you can't be truly neutral, right? You can respect people's agency and you can try your best to navigate those situations, but it's not like the gospel doesn't have an agenda to try and make people like actually navigate these issues. And, and not only that, the gospel prescribes the way to navigate these sorts of situations and interfaith situations. You don't have to check your religion at the door. You bring your religion to the table and you say, my religion, the Lord Jesus Christ has taught us how to navigate these issues together. Right? And that's what that's what she's not doing. And, I, and I'll say it again, her and Bridger alike, there's no foundation of truth. It's kind of just, this is, this is my philosophy. She even uses that word. This is my philosophy of how I do things. And it's like, okay, but where are you grounding yourself in? Where is the foundation? And if yeah. you're going to say agency, like you don't understand agency then. Like what's the deal? <laughs> For sure. Well, let's continue. Gotcha. I think that's that's so important because it's so important with like the difference between therapist and a member. Because so many people say, well, she is a member is saying that pornography is okay in the church. And that's to me not. No one ever said that she said that pornography is okay in the church. I never said that in the video. We'll, we'll look into what she said about pornography here in a minute. Not what all you were saying. I, you were not just identifying it as uh, in general for general population, not specific. Okay, so do you see how it makes that distinction? Yes. Where it's like, the, it, you were just talking about like the general population, that in the general population, it can be okay, right? Or that it is okay sometimes with people, right? And again, she keeps going here and let's just listen to what she says. Specifically towards members of the church. Right, and even members of the church. Some people have a lot more a uh, broad view of sexual what's okay sexually in relationships and some it's very narrow and that impacts how the couple relates and feels and uh you know so 
No, yeah, so morally neutral language. Yep. Again, she's being that that morally neutral. Sorry, I missed the spot here. Um, I, when it I came would, to mm, pornography, I would love for Bridger to ask her, Julie, do you believe that using pornography in any in any circumstance is sinful? I would be flabbergasted if she said yes. I I would expect her to say no. I would expect her to say there are well, times when well, it is let's listen to what she has said. In relationships, and some it's very narrow. And that really impacts really how the couple relates and feels and, uh, you know, Notice so. The morally neutral language that she was using there. She has to. But let's, let's listen. It's like for the rest of the world, like for most communities, this isn't even a problem. It's a problem old. because we say it's a problem. You cannot afford. Do you hear that? It's a problem because we say it's a problem. Yep. The prophets. So let's listen to the prophets. For it in any degree to become involved with pornography, whatever its form. It is poison. Do not watch it or read it. It will cloud your minds with evil and destroy your capacity to appreciate the good and the beautiful. But like there are plenty of relationships where it's not a thing. Thing. like mm -hmm. one or both partners look at porn or they look at it together and it's like the context makes a huge impact on how the couple deals with it right? suffice it to say that all who are involved become victims children are exploited and their lives are severely damaged the minds of youth become warped with false concepts mm -hmm. right yeah. and so i think um reducing the shame and kind of normalizing like look this is pretty common like this doesn't mean anything about you as a human being or like it's just this it's a thing that he's dealing with for some people their goal is abstinence like i never will do this ever again mm -hmm. i don't think that that's realistic you have to define abstinence is not realistic like here, let's let's set her going. Between the two of you, what is what is full recovery? What does that even look like? So you decide what full recovery is, even if that means you continue to watch pornography. Again, there's there's no foundation in the gospel of Jesus Christ whatsoever. If not, she only, not, not only no foundation. This is the opposite. And the thing is, is for them to say, oh, well, I wasn't saying like for members of the church that they should go and watch porn. Yeah, we know you didn't explicitly say that. What you said is that full recovery may not be be abstinence from porn. Like it, right. it's and then you imply that it that's OK, that that's an acceptable path. And then you say, you know, uh, the pro it's a problem because we make it a problem. No, it's a problem because it is immoral and it violates the laws of God. And Jesus Christ was the one that says, if you lust, look to, on a woman to lust on her, you uh, commit adultery. You commit adultery. And he says, if your eyes offend, you gouge them out. Yep. If your hand offend, you cut it off. He's he, like, he wasn't messing around. And for her to be like, yeah, you know, that kind of language, that's just problematic. It's like, what are you talking about? And to say, and to act like my video was like, oh, he's out there saying that I think all the members should look at porn. No, that's not what you're saying. What you're saying is that it's not that big of a deal. Right. And your language clearly conveys that. And your language conveys that the problem isn't inherent in the pornography itself, but it's in the way that the pornography affects the relationship. And for some relationships, it doesn't affect it that much. Therefore, it's not that bad unless it affects the relationship in a particular way. Yeah, depending on the context. Now, this is a whole other topic that we don't really have time to get into, it, and who knows what, how she would respond. But I wonder how she how she would um, justify the the what's the word I'm looking for, um, like the sex trafficking that is involved in porno in, in much of the pornography today. Like, does she, does she okay with that? Like, no, is she okay? I'm sure I'm sure she's against that. But her thing is is that. Right. Again, I don't think that there's going to be a coherent stance there to say, well, then, but, but, you know, if it's legal and it's, uh, these are consenting adults, you know, doing this, and then there are other consenting adults that they do this and they enjoy it in their relationship. But considering that's not all the porn that's being used that she may be, well, advocating for, not that she, she is specifically, 
may be involved. Anyway, that's a whole other topic. I'd be curious to know her thoughts on that. Yeah. Um, all righty. So what we're going to do here is we're actually going to take a quick um, break because we're going to break this up into two separate episodes. So we're going to wrap this episode up. But thank you, everyone, for joining us. And be sure to catch us in the next episode as we continue this conversation. If you enjoyed this video, give it a like and hit the subscribe button. Also, if you want more content, including the podcast, go to thoughtful-faith.com. Thanks for watching.